Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Blackett. I'm the Director of Product Management for our Zenworks Solutions. And today I'm going to be talking with you about what's new in Zenworks Service Desk 821. Before we jump into what's new, just a quick reminder about what Zenworks Service Desk is and why we recommend Zenworks Service Desk. Um, obviously, here at Microfocus, we have a couple of different Service Desk solutions. Our primary Service Desk solution is the SMAX solution. It's an ITIL service desk solution built for the largest of customers who can then integrate that into their broad enterprise. Zenworks Service Desk, on the other hand, is really targeted at kind of that mid-market, um, maybe the low side of the large market. It's really about being easy to deploy and configure. It's delivered as a virtual appliance. So all you have to do is drop it in, power it up, answer a few questions, and you're ready to get started. It's easy for end users to open calls. You've got email capabilities, you've got portal capabilities, and of course the technician can open it. It's lightweight, so again, you've got just this single appliance typically that you're using. You don't have a lot of extra uh, capabilities as far as uh, hooking into the various systems. There is a, a REST API that you can leverage should you need to. But what we find is most of our customers from an integration perspective are looking for integration with Zenworks. And so there's native Zenworks built in, as well as the enterprise store, which is integrated with Zenworks and also with LDAP. So if you want to place resources in the store that are going to be able to put you in a, an LDAP group and therefore get you a license to something or access to something else, you can automate that through the enterprise store. Now you could also write your own store extensions if you chose to do so to further extend that. Um, there's a document that describes how to do that in the documentation. So overall, it's that simple, easy to get up and get running and really be able to help you align your business more with those ITIL capabilities. All right, so let's look at what's new in 821. 821 is a minor release. But in addition to the quality releases, it has a number of things that we've done based on feedback from customers since 8.2 was released to continue to refine the technician request handling workflow. So 8.2, we completely redesigned how technicians used the system. And we've received some feedback, little tweaks that we can make that it further improves that, and we've made them. We've also received some feedback around Zenworks integration, and so we've implemented those as well. Now I'm going to go through each of the things on this list, so I won't read them off to you here, uh, but we'll go into each one of these. We'll see what they are. Um, in the presentation that's attached, there's also screenshots so that if you want to go back and review the presentation at your leisure, you can have a visual reminder of what you saw here as well. So let's jump in. Uh, the first one of these I want to talk about is quick calls in the main request workflow. So in Zenworks Service Desk 8.2, there are really two workflows in the technician portal. There's kind of the main how you open a ticket, and then there was something we had called quick requests. And in the 8.2 release, quick calls were something you could only open through a quick request. And so as we talked with our customers, they said, I want all of that capability that you added in 8.2 to be available when I do quick calls as well. And so in 8.2.1, we've added quick calls into that main quick request workflow. So we'll see that. We also, as part of that, added the show selected items only selection. So that as you add quick calls and it defines the item the quick call is on, we filter out all of the other items so that you know exactly what this is on. The benefits of this, technicians can now choose to open a, a normal request, a quick call, or a knowledge base request, all from the same workflow. You've got the advanced item selection available so that you can go in and if your quick call doesn't select an item, manually select it. And when the quick call is used, you only see the items that are selected by the quick call. So let's take a look at how this looks. So I'm gonna go over here and I've got my Zenworks Service Desk 821 and I'll go ahead and log in. And we'll go over here to the request tab. 
And so you can see the, the request we have. Now again, in 8.2, the way you would open a ticket if you were going to do so with a quick call was you'd use this quick request button. And so you'd be able to come in here real quick, pick the item, and then go ahead and, uh, or pick the quick call, and then be able to create the ticket. Now, the normal workflow, so a lot of people hide this quick request button because they want to go through this workflow. And so you'll come in here, you'll say, okay, I'm gonna add a ticket for this person. You can see there's a new option here for quick call, in which case you get your list of which quick calls can you create. In this case, I'm gonna say this is an additional access request call. You'll see as I scroll down then, this show selected entries only is the new feature here, and it's automatically filtering out everything but what was selected as part of the quick call. And so the great thing about that is you're not searching to try to find what it is. You're not scrolling down to figure out which item is currently selected. Now, of course, this has a custom form associated with it. And so I could go ahead and fill out the custom form. In this case, I'm requesting access to my demo environment. So I can say, these are the things that I wanna have access to. I want them as both an end user, and then I can provide any additional information that I want. I can say create the request, and now I'm done. So what you've seen there is the ability to open quick calls as part of your normal workflow in a, a much more streamlined fashion. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about is request type dynamic forms. We had a lot of feedback about the dynamic forms capabilities. People really liked that. Um, obviously in 8.2, we only had the capabilities to use those in quick calls. And so what we've done as a result of your feedback is we've now added the ability to use those dynamic forms in incidents, service requests, change requests, and even problems. The technician can define the dynamic form. Then when they're opening the ticket, they select which of those dynamic forms that are associated based on the type. And now you can fill that form out. This is great because it means you don't have to always have a quick call to open an incident, but you can still use the dynamic form. So let's take a look at how that's been implemented. So if I come over here to the home page, you'll see we've got dynamic forms. And right now, all of the dynamic forms I have are associated in some sh way, shape, or form with a quick call. Now I'm gonna create a new one, and let's just say I want to have something that every incident I open has a, an incident default form, right? And so I can say this is going to be for incidents, maybe it's not going to be for quick calls or service requests or change requests, and then I can start to build out my form. So maybe I've got just a quick, uh, location, that's the name, and then my data. Got a couple of different places I could be. Let's say I'm, I can be in Provo, I can be in Harriman, I can be in Bangalore. And so you can see what the user is gonna see as a drop-down list like this. I could pick a default value if I wanted to. I can also control um, on the validation, whether this is a required field or not. And so it gets a little star that says, hey, this is required. We'll save that. Um, maybe we'll also have a radio button here that says, um, are customers impacted? So that we can find out if this is impacting our customers. If the answer is yes, then maybe we need to treat this with higher priority. Again, we could make this something that is required. We'll say save that, and now we've got those two fields. We'll save this. Now I have this incident default form that I've created. And now as a technician, when I go to create a new incident, so I can come in here and let's open this on behalf of my wife here. And you can see I'm opening an incident I could say, well, I'm having some issues with whatever it is that I'm having issues with. So let's see, uh, Surface. So maybe she's having an issue with her Surface. You'll also see there's that location. Um, this was actually something I've added in the item field. So you'd, you'd see this. Um, but as I come down here, 
Um, you'll also see this is where I have that dynamic form I can pick from. So when I pick the incident dynamic form, that's the form that I am going to fill out for this incident versus this was actually part of the uh, definition of the custom fields I had done earlier, um, kind of before dynamic forms were available. So I can now pick my values for the form, fill out the data, and create the request. So you could now have multiple forms for the different incident types. So if you have an incident and a different form for service requests and a different form for change requests, you can name them in such a way um, that I can pick them from a drop-down list based on the type of incident I'm in. It'll filter out the ones that are relevant for that request type, and then you can pick them. So that's dynamic forms and request types. Let's take a look at email automation and workflows. This is the one that kind of is a, a little bit bigger impact um, that was based on a long-term customer request. This basically now gives you a new option in any workflow step in the customizable workflow to enable sending a custom email as part of that workflow step. So when you hit that step in the workflow, custom email gets sent. You can use macros or variables in that email. You can also automate it changing to another step. And so maybe the only thing you want to have happen is when it goes to this step, it sends an email. And as long as that email is successfully sent, it automatically goes to the next step. You can also flag this so that the state requires feedback from the user. And so that way it gets flagged for the user that, hey, they have stuff to do. The great thing about this is it provides an automated email notification to end users as part of the workflow. And so if they need help, if you need them to you know, do something as part of the workflow normally, you can alert them to that fact instead of having to have the technician always add that note and send it to them that way. So let's take a look at how this works. Over here under service, I have a workflow set up. That workflow is for requesting hardware. So I have this Zengru hardware purchase workflow. And in my life cycle, you can see the basic flow. It goes through and gets some approval. It asks for the line manager's approval and the item manager's approval. Then it gets waiting for purchasing. So it goes into purchasing's queue. It gets ordered. Once it gets received, it gets tagged. And then it automatically goes to this item sent. So somebody puts it and says, I've tagged it. I'm going to put it in the mail and send it to Jason. It's going to go to this step. And you'll see in this step, with 821, I've actually added a custom email. And so it says, your requested whatever the item type is that you requested has been sent to you. Then it gives the customer some instructions about what, what's next. Hey, you've, you've got this. I've sent it to you. When you receive this item, please approve the incident and we'll go ahead and close it. And then it automatically flags it as additional information required from the customer so that the customer knows in the request list, hey, I need this. All right, so now we have all of that. Let's see how it works. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a new ticket from the end user portal. So I'll log in here. And I'll go over to the store. And I'll request a piece of hardware. So I'll request this Galaxy S8. And so when I request the S8, it comes up, gives me the request description. You can see all of that. Say, OK, I want to request that. And now I've got my request. Now you'll see it's now currently in my awaiting line manager approval. So fortunately for me, I know the line manager's password. So we'll go ahead over here. We'll log in as the manager to his user portal. Well, that's my boss. And he's going to have a request in here. And he can see it's a waiting line manager approval. He can see the information I provided. And he can then say, approve this. Yep, approved. So we approve that. 
you'll see it now goes to awaiting line manager approval. In this case, it's probably going to go to whoever the uh, telecom guy is to make sure that this meets whatever um, policies you might have in place as it relates to ordering phones. So in this case, I happen to be the item manager in here. So I could say, okay, I'm going to approve this. Um, I could say confirmed that the employee last got a new phone in 2018 approved for order purchasing. So we'll approve this. And now you see it goes into waiting for purchasing. So now if we went over here into the technician portal, we can start to make changes. So I'll come into this request and I'll work through it. Obviously, if I was doing this um, in production, I'd be going into the purchasing system and adding this. Here, I'm just gonna kick it through the different actions. So, okay, I've ordered the item, so we'll save this. Of course, now once the item gets ordered, the item's been received and tagged. Now that I've received and tagged it, I'm gonna go ahead and send it to the user. So we'll send it to the user. We've dropped it in the mail. As soon as I flagged it, item sent awaiting user confirmation. Then I can go over here to my mailbox as the user and see what happened. And I'm using the web interface and I've integrated this in with advanced authentication. So you can see here, I've got this latest email that came from the help desk that's my custom email. So the store Galaxy S8 you requested from IT has been successfully provisioned is being sent to your location. When you receive this, please approve the item so that we know you received it. So at this point then, as the user, once it shows up in my inbox, you know, I can look here, you can see it's sent here. I've got the little notification that, hey, this is waiting for me. I can go ahead and say, approve, received the device. Say approve, and now this gets closed resolved, and we're done with the workflow. I've got my device, IT knows I got my device, and we're good to go. All right, so what you've seen there is the ability to do email automation in your workflows. You can do this as an, in as many steps in the workflow as you need to based on what you need the user to do. All right, let's look at the next one. This is probably the most highly requested item that we had in this release based on feedback from technicians. As you add, techni or as you add notes to a ticket, very often you want to then change the status. Maybe in what you were just seeing when we were ticking through things where I was purchasing items, then I was tagging items, you want to add a note with each one of those. In Service Desk 8.2, those were actually separate steps as well as earlier versions. And so you'd basically have to add a note, save that note, then go change the status. What we've done here is basically make that something you can do as an atomic operation. So let's come in here to one of my requests. And we've got this test incident that we created earlier. So if I wanted to add a note here, you can see right now the status is impending. I could obviously change it here, but oftentimes you want to do a note with this. So you can say, I'm going to add a note. And if you had a template, you could put in your your information, or I could just say uh, assigning this to me, talk to the user, and the problem is blah, right? And then I can now say change the status of this request as part of the note, and let's change this to open and add note. And so now the note gets added and the ticket 
ends up in the open status. And so now you have one less step that you're doing all day long. Because obviously adding notes, changing status is probably the thing that technicians do more often than anything else in the system. And so we're trying to make this as easy as possible. All right, in addition to kind of those bigger things, we've made a number of just smaller workflow usability enhancements. I'm gonna show you each of these as we go through, so I'm not gonna just read the list right now. Um, but the general benefits are typically technicians have fewer clicks and find it easier to access the information they need. Um, also, there's a, a couple of enhancements here where uh, behavior was changed based on feedback just to make that flow a little bit easier for the user. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this works. So the first one, URLs in descriptions, notes, and subjects are now automatically available as hyperlinks. So if I come in and add something to a note and say, um, sent the user to https microfocus.com, right? you can see it automatically became a link I can add the note, there's my note, and if I uh, you know, wanna look at the details of that note, I can see the note, I can click on that. You can also see if I come down here um, to the description and say, I am unable to access microfocus.com. and save that. You'll see that that's also known as, or also seen as a link here. And so in the note or the description or the subject, I can always click and it's gonna take me to that location. All right, next thing is when I'm in an incident, previously we had this item pop up now we have this customer pop out as well. So if I need more details about the customer for some reason, I can click here. It's gonna take me in a new tab to that customer's details where I can see what other requests they have open or see whatever other items they might have. So simple, but important to technicians. All right, another one, and you saw this as we were opening tickets, but as I open a ticket in 821, if I click a new ticket, and we'll show you a couple of things while we're right here, call attention to them. First of all, uh, when I add a user in here, let's say I'm going to open up a, a ticket for Bob here. You'll notice that when I selected Bob, it added Bob and now it expanded it. So in previous versions, when 8.2, when you added Bob, it came in and Bob was set up like this. And so that meant then the technician had to expand this and then the technician could start providing information about the item. And then when they picked the item, same thing, they'd have to expand the item if they wanted to make changes. And so now when you add a customer, the first customer that you add is automatically expanded in the system to make that fast. Um, then if you pick an item, let's say uh, I'm gonna open this item, you'll see that that automatically gets expanded as well. And that if there are mandatory fields, it becomes very clear to you right away that, hey, there are fields in here that you need to fill out. So custom classification is test, and my location is Bangalore, and now the red disappears so that I know I've got everything I need filled out in this request. And then I can come in, put in my subject, test, test, and now I can create the request. Now in 8.2, you then had the option to close this, in which case you could open another ticket, or you could click the go to request page, in which case you could go back to the, your request list. Very often, the thing you wanna do is actually go to the details of the ticket you just opened. And so if I click in here, it will now take me directly to that ticket where I can then start to add notes, uh, make other changes as necessary. All right, um, next, when we are in a ticket like this and we're looking for an item, let's say we wanna change our item now. 
you'll see that in previous releases, this dropdown was limited to 10 items. You can see there's 10 items in this list, but now it's scrollable. And so I can scroll down and pick any of them through this list and say, okay, I know that what she really wanted to report this on uh, was this Technicolor router, not based on her other thing. And so then I could go ahead and make that change. That same scrollable list is also available when you're creating a ticket. So when you do your item search here and you put in your 100, again, you can scroll that list here. If you have multiple categories, let's get rid of this. You can see same thing here. I can scroll through the list of categories and I can scroll through the list of item types. Let's get rid of that. And so you can see not limited to 10, you can always scroll through now. So that makes it much easier for everybody to uh, open tickets. Next, on the quick call side, we had a couple of requests that when you created a quick call template, the subject was always mandatory. And so that is no longer the case. You'll notice the little red bar is not here anymore. Um, the great thing about that is um, a lot of customers, when they wanted to create the request, wanted to make sure they left the subject blank um, and then have the technician opening the ticket or the end user opening the ticket fill that data in. And so now you can do that. Essentially, you don't have to save it in the call, but it's still required or can be set as required in the ticket itself. And so when the ticket is opened, then until they put in a subject, they can't open the ticket. <clears throat> All right, one last interesting capability you'll notice here, we had the old pages. So in 8.1x releases, if you wanted to get to your incidents or your service requests, you would come to the operations tab or to the change tab and you'd get your list. And you'll see we, we put these here so that as people try to relearn with muscle memory, uh, if they happen to keep trying to go to the old place, it just makes it easy for them to do a one click and now they're right back here at the requests and they can learn, okay, this is where I go. Well, after a probably relatively short amount of time, end users learn or technicians learn they don't need to do that anymore. And so in 821, there is a new option in the privileges where you can turn those off and those tabs will simply disappear. So if I come over here to privileges, and system. You can see I have this hide old pages. I'll say yes to that. I'll save that. And now if I go back to the user page and I click on operations, for instance, you'll notice that the incidents and the service request tabs are gone because we assume the user knows those are under requests and you just have the things that shouldn't be there anymore. Same thing if I go to change, and also if I go to home, my, my tasks has disappeared there as well. So lots of very small usability enhancements, but we think it will lead to a, a much better adoption and uh, quality of life for the technician. All right, let's go back and look at SSL certificate trust changes. So with SSL certificate trust, by default in previous versions of Service Desk, if you added, say, an, uh, an email server that uses SSL, it didn't matter if the certificate was from a trusted source or not, we would automatically allow the SSL connection to go through. In this new setup, you can continue to have that behavior be the case. There's a system preference to determine whether to do that or not. And then if not, when you're adding a new server, you'll get the option to say, I want to trust that certificate if it's an untrusted certificate or issued by an untrusted authority. As a result of that, we also have, if you go into, let's just take a quick look at setup um, and we'll go to the LDAP server for instance. And over here, 
And actually, I guess I better turn off the privilege for just a minute. So I have that privilege turned on right now. So it's in the, the setup where it's going to accept all certificates. So if I come over here to system and I turn that off, so instead of saying trust all SSL connections, I say no. Now the system will want to make sure that I trust certificates. So if I come into a particular server here, you'll see I now get this certificate button next to each of the hosts. And if I click on that, I can see what the certificate is. And when I'm adding them, then I'm able to uh, say, yes, I want to trust the certificate or not. So that makes the system a bit more secure. All right, now we're going to shift out of kind of the technician improvements, um, at least in the main workflow, and look more at the ZenWorks integration workflow. Um, we really did two things in the ZenWorks side here. First of all, we did ZenWorks remote control improvements. When you're remote controlling a device from the ticket now, instead of only being able to select the workstation that the ticket is assigned to, that would have to be the item, you can now remote control any device that the user who opened the ticket is on. This now gives you the ability to help the technician or the, the customer um, wherever they happen to be, not just on kind of that original device. So let's take a look at how this looks. If I go to a ticket, let's go back to the user portal and I go to requests. And I can find a request. Uh, we'll use this one. This is for my device. You can see it's for my customer. If I come down here to remote control, previously, you didn't have this ZenWorks device because it would automatically select the item that was attached to this incident. Now I can select that, and you can see the devices that um, are appropriate. So in this one, you can see I'm logged in. That's what the asterisk means, is I'm logged in right now on both of these devices. This first one is the one I'm actually demonstrating on. This second one is a virtual machine where I'm currently logged into ZenWorks as well. So I can go ahead and say, I want to remote control this device because that's the one the user's on right now and needs help with. I can say start, and it's going to go ahead and now do the remote control it's going to kick off the TLS connection. And as long as my VM has continued to run, you'll see over here, I'm now being prompted. And I can say yes. And so now I'm remote controlling. So close that. And so what you saw there is really the ability to, no matter which device the user happens to be on, as long as it's a ZenWorks device, you're going to be able to select from that drop-down list on whether he's in, logged into one or 50 devices, pick the device that he's on, pick the IP address or DNS name based on the configuration, and then be able to assist the user. Um, another thing I'll mention just real quick is in the upcoming ZenWorks 2020 Update 2 release, we're adding new capabilities for remote chat and for the ability to remote record remote control sessions. And so what's kind of cool about that is after you do the remote control session as a technician, that recording and that chat log end up on your local machine. And if you wanted to attach that to the notes in the ticket, you could do that. The other ZenWorks thing that we changed is store assignment configuration via the GUI. So when you're configuring the store in ZenWorks Service Desk, Previously, there was a properties file that you configured that was global. And so you'd basically say, I want any app that gets provisioned from the store to automatically show up in these locations, on the desktop, on the start menu, on the taskbar, in the app window, whatever. But they were global. You couldn't say, for this app, I want this to happen. For this other app, I want something else to happen. So what we've done is we've now built this into the GUI and on either the store template or the individual store item, you can now configure that. This means that you can have different items that you deliver in different ways to the user. So let's look at how that works. 
if I come over here and I go to the store setup, I can then go over to either store templates or store items. So I might come in here and say, anytime I have something that's auto approved, I want it to show up in certain places. Right? Or I can go to an individual store item. In this case, I'm gonna to go to the Zenworks Control Center. And I've said, anytime somebody requests this application, override whatever the default is and put it on the desktop and put it on the application window. So that means if I go over here to the store and I say, I want the Zenworks Control Center, since this is auto approved, you'll see that it automatically went to close service assigned. And if I now minimize this so we can see the desktop, and I request or I refresh Zenworks. Because after the store assignment was made or was resolved, it is going to put me in that assignment list. You'll see because of the configuration I had there, it's now put it on the desktop. And if I was to open up the window, you'll see it's now there in the window as well. So you now have the ability from within the console to control where those things are going to show up. All right, last thing I want to talk about um, is a new capability for attachment previews. So Zenworks Service Desk now uses idle key view to generate attachment previews. Really, you're going to get the first page of the preview and a thumbnail. Um, going forward, we may choose to extend that based on feedback from customers. Uh, but we, we decided to start there. That was the lowest cost, um, both from a performance perspective um, as well as a storage perspective. And so there's a new setting. It's on by default on an upgrade. Um, if you come into Setup and you go to Privileges and under Privileges, you go to System there's a new setup or privilege called attachment preview. So if you don't want this, feel free to turn it off. Um, if you want it, keep it on. Once you have that turned on, then when you add attachments to a request, we're going to attach that. And then if it's something that the key view process knows how to do, we'll go ahead and we'll generate those thumbnails. So if I take a look at my uh, having general weirdness ticket here. You can see I've got some attachments and I've got thumbnails that have already been generated. And so you can see I've got a, a PNG file. I've got a PDF file. If I click on that, I can see what the, that looks like. If I click on the PDF, I can see the PDF um, details. I can see this is a Visio document. Um, and so there are about 70, 75 different file types where you'll get these thumbnails. And if you click on it, you'll get a broader view of that. You'll see if for some reason this is not something that is previewable, you'll just kind of get the file. In this case, this is a, a certificate file. You can't really preview the certificate file. And so it doesn't show you anything. Um, if you wanted that, you'd have to download the certificate and, and look at it. But overall, this gives you the ability to very quickly see things like, hey, the user sent me a screenshot. What's that screenshot look like? or maybe they have an application like Visio where they've done a diagram um, and you could take a look at that diagram without needing to have Visio on the device. Um, all the office documents, as you might expect, are supported. All your common uh, graphics types, your text files, PDFs, et cetera, um, are all supported. All right, so those are the new capabilities what's in Zenworks Service Desk 821. So the call to action here is if you don't already have Zenworks Service Desk, then request the Zenworks Suite Trial today and you can try it out. Um, the Suite Trial has all of the Zenworks components so you can try out Service Desk, you can also try out things like desktop containers 
or endpoint security management. Um, for instance, with the, the next version of Zenworks Endpoint Security Management, we're introducing antivirus, anti-malware into the Zenworks ecosystem. Um, so you can go in, check out the suite, um, and do an evaluation of Zenworks Service Desk. If you do own Zenworks Service Desk, or you own ZCM, or you own the Zenworks suite, then you already own Service Desk as well. In which case, if you've got a Zenworks Service Desk appliance, simply go into the Appliance Console. So I'll show you how to do this really quick. Um, if you go to, mine's going through a proxy, and so I have to go directly to the IP address to get to the 9443 port. Log in to the appliance. And when you log into the appliance, go over here to online update and then check for updates. Um, if you haven't yet registered, make sure you register, put in your uh, service desk activate, uh, updates activation key from the SLD portal. And then you can say update now, that will update it. It'll take a minute or two to upgrade the RPMs as well as then it'll need to do a, a database schema update. Once that's done, all of these new capabilities will be available to you. And that's all you need to know about Service Desk 821 today. I appreciate you taking the time to join us and hope to see you in future webinars. Thank you.